Okay, so now that we understand and establish that the primal drive of of material, uh, I should say, organic creatures, organic beings, so beings with organs, is driven by, or one of the primal ones is driven by, the drive to procreate, to create more of yourself, to survive. However, this is not exactly survival of the fittest, because I actually believe in the work of Friedrich Nietzsche, which would actually say stronger than the the uh, drive to just survive is the drive for power, which is what Nietzsche calls the will to power. And I actually think that he, he's correct. Following on the evolutionary work of Herbert Spencer, he outshines both Spencer and Darwin in the sense that natural selection is um, is actually not the foundation of our drives, but sexual selection is. And I'm not going to actually go into that, but it's something worth looking into. Uh, reading Nietzsche and the will to power and also his work on uh, sexual selection. So once we understand that this drive is functioning in all of life and all of our our um, multiplicity, it's functioning in the psyche as well. The, the emotions, the energy in motion, the mind or the psyche, and of course the physical body all simultaneously. Back to the erogenous zones, I wanted to kind of segue here and just talk about the work of Eric Newman. So Eric Newman was a direct uh, pupil and study studied under the great psychologist Carl Jung. And of course, I am a Jungian in that sense, and I think Carl Jung's work is, is still the foundation of our modern psychoanalysis. And I think it's basically correct when it comes to the archetypes and the symbols, the way the mind works and the way that... Um, man's psyche is formed as a being when the being actually realizes that he or she exists is when um, some other being looks upon them like usually it's the mother or the father and the child at some point early on realizes oh I'm in here because there's some other entity that's giving me attention that's looking at me and then of course connecting with me. That's how the, the ego begins to be formed and the personality begins to be formed. So in that process, that process is driven by um, libido or sexual energy. And so Eric Newman points out that in his book called The Child, which is about the development of the, the mind of a child and the being of a child and the personality of a child, one of the things that really stuck with me that I didn't realize is that even though we're born in a womb and there's that's an embryo we're in an embryonic state in the womb we are one of the only creatures that we are actually in, in an embryonic state as far as our mind is concerned and our being our psyche for a full year after we've been born so for 12 months outside of the womb the way in which our mind forms we are actually still in an embryonic state which means that all kinds of things happen to us because we're in a new environment. We have all kinds of exchanges with life and with our parents and with our society. And all that, we're still in an embryonic state. We're just basically sponging in stuff. And this is pretty obvious to see because other animals are born and they can basically walk or run within minutes or hours, um, most of them. And so they're not in an embryonic state. They are in a state to, um, to engage with life immediately. But human child is basically helpless for at least a year, at least. So it's interesting the way that our psyche is set up that way, and yet we are such a dominant force on the earth once we do mature. Uh, we can obviously affect the planet and affect nature in, in strong and powerful ways. So just pointing that out, that Eric Newman's work is profound, and he also talks about the erogenous zones of the body. So that book is worth reading, The Child by Eric Newman. And so reading on the work of Wilhelm Reich, more about the Oedipus or Oedipus complex, which I think we've probably all heard of, which sounds really strange, but, um, you know, he says here that the central psychic conflict is the sexual relationship between child and parent. And it just seems so weird that our, our primary sexual relationship, especially one of conflict, is set up with our, our parents. Because, you know, most children, you know, you're not thinking in sexual terms when you're with your parents. But, but it does make sense because we get our nourishment from the breast of the mother. And we also get skin-to-skin -skin contact from the breast of our mother and our father. And so they set up our whole uh, archetype for uh, 
certainty and safety and food and nourishment and um, they're basically taking care of us because we're helpless and the fact that we get our nourishment from the erogenous zone of the mother it's it's actually a trigger in the mother although subconscious because it's an erogenous zone of her body and then it's going into an erogenous zone of the child's body which is the mouth and then of course all that comes out the other end which is also an erogenous zone so this this uh, Oedipus or Oedipus complex is real our primary sexual relationship is actually with both our parents and sometimes one is stronger than the other so this is why all this work is important if your parents are neurotic or if they don't understand this type of stuff and they they tend to have conflict or trauma in their life they can project that onto their child subconsciously and not know it and I would go so far as to say that that's actually what's happening in the in our society and has been for a very long time and those are whole other sociological questions but I mean it's obvious that this has been a practice in the Western world all the way back from the times of the Greeks where they would uh, fragment the psychology of a young child um, in order to bring them into the church and then you see this obviously in the church nowadays with the Catholic Church at least where it's a problem and you gotta wonder where where it came from and why it's still being practiced and what's going on in the Western psyche and that's why this work is so important. So I'll read on. Now he's talking about orgastic potency or impotency. And this basically means your ability to have a um, what you would call a full orgasm. And that's a hard term to define, but we're going to get into that. So when you hear orgastic potency, it's like it's like or impotency is your your ability or non ability to have a full blown body orgasm with just nothing but pleasure no inhibitions and basically nothing in your in your mind or in your in your spirit at that time other than that so orgastic impotence has always been in the forefront of sex economic research and all of its details are still not known its role in sex economy is similar to the role of the oedipus complex in psychoanalysis Whoever does not have a precise understanding of it cannot be considered a sex economist. He will never really grasp its ramifications. He will not understand the difference between health and sickness. Nor will he comprehend human pleasure, anxiety, or the pathological nature of the parent-child conflict and the misery of marriage. It is even possible that he will endeavor to bring about sexual reforms, but he will never touch upon the core of sexual misery. He might admire the Bion experiments, even imitate them perhaps, but he will never really conduct research in the field of sex economy. He will never comprehend religious ecstasy, nor have the least insight into fascist, fascist irrationalism. Because he lacks the most important fundamentals, he will of necessity adhere to the antithesis between nature and culture instinct and morality, sexuality and achievement. He will not be able to really solve a single pedagogic problem. He will never understand the identity between sexual process and the life process, nor consequently will he be able to grasp the sex economic theory of cancer. He will mistake sickness for health and health for sickness. He will end up misinterpreting man's fear of happiness. In short, he might be anything but he will never be a sex economist who knows that man is the sole biological species that has destroyed its own natural sexual function and is sick as a consequence of this. Pretty bold statements, but for those of you out there who don't think the Western society or Western psychology is sick, um, I would just say that you're, you're in denial. And if you look at our practices, which I won't go into, but... The way we treat families, which are all broken apart these days, the way we, we treat elderly, no ancestral respect or even ancestral worship, um, the way we treat animals, uh, and the way we treat our food, you know, it's, um, it's becoming less and less natural. And Real, Wilhelm Reich is saying that all of these sicknesses are due to our lack of understanding of our own biology and our own sexual impulse. And it's causing all these different neuroses.